Okay, sorry for the delay. Good evening, doctors, um, for our uh, lecture series from Campbell. Um, I would be discussing about renal physiology. So um, the, fundament, the fundamental function of the kidney is to filter the blood. So um, renal blood flow uh, makes up around 20% 20, 20 of the cardiac output with the body at rest. And the average adult circulates nearly five liters of blood per minute for cardiac output. From that perspective, the kidney's capacity for continuous filtration is remarkable. Um, in addition, the complex handling of solutes by the kidney is a critical component for maintaining homeostasis. So the glomerular filtration rate um, is a reflection of the movement from the filtrate across the membrane and an estimate of hydraulic and oncotic pressure differences between the glomerular capillary and the Bowman space. So after the blood passes from the main renal artery, it travels through smaller and smaller branching interlobar, um, arcuate, and um, interlobular arteries until it reaches the afferent arterial. So at this point, uh, at that point, the blood can enter the glomer glomerular capillary at the glomerular apparatus. And there, um, passive filtration would occur across the membrane. So, um, with uh, use of plasma creatinine to estimate GFR, two formulas have been widely accepted, and the cockcroft gault and the MDRD formulas. So the cockcroft gault equation um, actually overestimates creatinine clearance and is no longer widely used clinically for purposes other than drug dosing estimates. Uh, the MDRD formula seen below is more accurate comparatively and accounts for severe renal impairment. Um, however, both are less accurate in individuals with normal or only mildly reduced GFR. So hence, a more recent equation called the ckd epi may be preferable for use in the general population and, and older individuals and may impose, uh, improve risk prediction for CKD and adverse events associated with CKD. So, in yung formula. Pero hindi naman natin sinasolve yan. Marami tayong apps for that. So um, before uh, we under can understand anything about renal function, um, the basic unit of the kidney, which is the nephron, its anatomy must be carefully studied or considered. So reabsorption describes uh, movement from tubular lumen back to the blood and the term secretion indicates movement from the blood into the tubular lumen. So starting at the proximal convoluted tubule, approximately 60% of the glomerular filtrate is reabsorbed. Um, under normal circumstances, the PCT, or the proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorbs 65% of the filtered sodium, potassium, and calcium, 80% of filtered phosphate, water, and bicarbonate, and 100% of the glucose and amino acids. Um, after the proximal convoluted tubule comes the loop of Henle, which comprises the thin descending limb, uh, the thin ascending limb, um, the medullary thick ascending limb and the cortical thick ascending limb. Uh, although each segment differs in specific activity, the overall function of the loop of Henle is reabsorption of 25 to 30 percent of the filtered sodium and creation of a highly concentrated medullary interstitium, which is the basis for the countercurrent exchange. Um, the thin descending limb is highly, highly water permeable, whereas the thin and thick ascending limbs are water impermeable. So, the thin descending limb. Um, dun lulusot yung water and yung thin and thick ascending limbs dun uh, lulusot yung solutes. So the distal tubule comprises um, first the uh, distal convoluted tubule and the connecting tubule. The, in these segments, uh, significant sodium and calcium reabsorption occurs. After this, the collecting tubule is encountered in which the cortical and medullary collecting tubules demonstrate slightly different functions. Uh, both handle transport of sodium via principal cells and acid loads via intercalated cells, as well as potassium via both cell types. Um, in the medullary collecting tubule, however, um, tight regulated control of water and urea permeability exists, uh, allowing for this area of the collecting tubule to concentrate urine to a much greater level than the plasma. So uh, most of the kidney's total sodium reabsorption occurs in the PCT. Um, secondary active and passive mechanisms uh, account for this movement. So in secondary active resorption, 
um, there is the uh, sodium potassium AT phase pump at the basolateral cell membrane. Um, um, uh, and it functions to exchange three intracellular sodium for two extracellular potassium ions. So it's um, thereby lowering the intracellular, intracellular sodium levels. Uh, sodium then enters the tubule cell via coupled transport or a, a sodium um, hydrogen antiporter. Um, in, in passive resorption, uh, sodium moves paracellularly into the intercellular, intercellular space mediated through chloride transport channels that creates an electrochemical gradient, which drives sodium out of the tubular lumen into the intercellular space. Um, an additional 25 to 35 35% 30, of sodium reabsorption occurs in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So, similar to the proximal convoluted tubule, um, a basolateral uh, sodium potassium AT phase pump keeps intracellular le um, sodium levels low. Sodium is also transported by the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter on the apical membrane. Um, and these transporters are the active target of loop diuretics like furosemide that bind the um, chloride receptor, thereby decreasing sodium chloride reabsorption, leading to diuresis. So the distal convoluted tubule then reabsorbs an additional 5 to 10% of sodium filtered through the glomerulus. So around only 1% of sodium um, exits the, the, the tubular system. Um, a basolateral sodium potassium AT phase pump and sodium chloride um, tra co-transporter in addition to a sodium and hydrogen exchange transporter in the membrane of the lumen are also found here. So the sodium um, two chloride transporter is directly inhibited by thiazide diuretics like HCTZ. So the pathological state of sodium imbalances in the body are driven by free water excess relative to sodium content. Um, evaluation of the patient with sodium imbalances should always start with the determination of fluid status, such as skin turgor, blood pressure, um, JV, um, JVP, um, and distension uh, as by inspection and looking for an abdominal fluid wave or listening for respiratory crackles. So etiologies of severe sodium deficit or excess must be determined through history or assessment of volume status and corrected slowly. So for the potassium, um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, its reabsorption is passive through the paracellular route in a parallel direction as sodium and water movement. At the level of the collective tubule, um, potassium transport is handled by the same basolateral sodium potassium AT phase pump that manages sodium transport. Uh, changes in sodium availability and movement thus alter potassium secretion, um, such as can be induced with aldosterone. In, ad in addition, uh, potassium channels exist um, whose density in the luminal membrane is altered by ADH, or the antidiuretic hormone. Um, urinary excretion can be increased in the kidney through increased aldosterone. So a high sodium load um, in the distal tubule and by acidosis. So hypokalemia is most commonly caused by GI and renal losses, as well as system, systemic alkalosis, leading to an intracellular shift of potassium. And hyperkalemia is most commonly caused by impaired potassium renal excretion and systemic acidosis, um, driving extracellular movement of potassium. Uh, so evaluation for um, symptoms of hypo and hyperkalemia includes a careful history as well as an assessment for cardiac symptoms and an ECG. Um, hemolysis should be ruled out as a spurious cause of hyperkalemia and once confirmed, treatment should be dictated by severity and acuity of elevation as well as clinical signs and symptoms. So for the water, water reabsorption in PCT is a passive process driven by the reabsorption of other solutes and the subsequent osmotic gradient that develops between the lumen and the intercellular space. So majority of water resorption occurs in the late PCT and as with sodium movement, water can also move either transcellularly through in one channels or paracellularly across tight junctions. So the water permeability of the cortical collecting tubule is low in the basal state. However, it can be greatly increased in the presence of ADH due to the insertion of preformed aquaporin 2 water channels into the luminal membrane. So pag ADH, um, yung aquaporin 2 water channels yung involved. Pero yung transcellular movement ng water uh, na walang kinalaman sa any hormone is through aquaporin 1 channels. 
So um, the medullary um, collecting uh, tubule is uh, relatively impermeable to water in the basal state. But under the influence of ADH, permeability increases um, in the inner and outer uh, MCT by the insertion of aquaporin into channels. So ADH regulates free water excretion by increasing passive water absorption in the collecting duct. Interacts with the V2 receptor, which leads to the insertion of again aquaporin 2 channels in the principal cell luminal membrane. For calcium, um, reabsorption occurs mostly in the PCT around 75%, followed by the thick ascending loop of Henle around 15%, and the DCT around 10 to 15%. In the proximal convoluted tubule in the loop of Henle, transport is primarily passive across the paracellular route via the um, cloud in two calcium tight junction channels and the C16 channels. So hypercalciuria in the context of renal stones most often represents a renal leak of calcium. So although it can be associated with a renal phosphate leak, which is a sign of hyperparathyroidism um, or a dietary dependent um, absorptive issue. For stone prevention, hypercalciuria is treated with thiazide diuretics to increase urinary calcium excretion. Um, so for the acid-base balance, um, to maintain the, this, this balance, the kidney acts mostly by regulating the transport of um, hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. So by the bicarbonate is the main buffer regulated by the kidney. Around 80% um, of filtered bicarbonate is resorbed in the PCT. And of the remaining 20%, approximately half is resorbed in the thick ascending loop, loop of Henley and uh, the, uh, the other half in the collecting duct. So in the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henley, um, uh, uh, so hydrogen is secreted by the sodium um, hydrogen antiporter. So carbonic anhydrase um, catalyzes the combining of um, bicarbonate with um, hydrogen within the lumen, forming uh, water and carbon dioxide. They then diffuse into the intercellular space, intracellular space, where carbonic anhydrase again catalyzes the conversion back to hydrogen and bicarbonate. So, para lang makapasok. Bi uh, bicarbonate is then secreted back into the vascular circulation across the basal lateral membrane through a sodium coupled transporter. Thus, um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide can be used to reduce bicarbonate reabsorption and increase sodium and water excretion. So regulation of um, hydrogen secretion occurs through multiple biochemical and hormonal actions. So um, volume depletion leads to sodium retention um, and enhanced bicarbonate absorption with a net loss of hydrogen. Um, elevated PCO2, as seen in, in chronic respiratory acidosis, will lead to a renal response of increased um, hydrogen ion secretion. So reduced GFR will reduce the amount of filtered bicarbonate, leading to increased hydrogen ion excretion. Um, high, high aldosterone le uh, levels indirectly increase um, hydrogen secretion, um, excretion by increasing sodium reabsorption. And low potassium and low chloride um, levels increase bicarbonate reabsorption and can maintain chronic metabolic alkalosis. So renal defects in tubular hydrogen secretion can cause a group of acid-base imbalance disorders called, called the renal tubular acidosis or RTA, um, uh, they have uh, types one, two, and four. So type four is caused by dysfunctional cation exchange in the distal tubule that leads to decreased um, hydrogen and potassium secretion. Type two is caused by bicarbonate being unable to be resorbed in the proximal tubule, leading to bicarbonate loss with resulting systemic acidosis. But type um, one is the most relevant to urologic practice since um, this is usually caused by recurrent uh, associated with recurrent calcium phosphate stone formation. So in type 1 RTA, hydrogen ions are, is an, unable to be secreted in the distal nephron, resulting in a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis marked by a high urinary pH um, of more than 5.5 and low serum bicarbonate and low urinary citrate. So probably it's because of the citrate. So type 1 RTA is associated again with recurrent calcium, calcium phosphate stone formation, likely driven by the low urinary citrate, high urinary pH, and hypercalciuria. So potassium citrate supplementation and urinary alkalinization are the primary forms of treatment 
to prevent urinary stone formation. So again, type 1 RTA is the only type associated with renal stones. Um, so multiple hormones are involved in regulating vasoconstriction. One important factor is the renin angiotensin, angiotensin system or the RAS, where in response to decreased renal blood flow, the kidney converts pro-renin into renin and releases um, renin into the circulation. So renin in turn, in turn converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 via the ACE, primarily in the lungs. So angiotensin 2 interacts with the AT1 and AT2 receptors in the kidney, leading to vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, um, aldosterone release, and then the retention of sodium. So the net effect of angiotensin 2 is to increase systemic vascular resistance and maintain GFR when renal blood flow is reduced. So norepinephrine, um, may mga hormones that can um, affect uh, and cause vasoconstriction in the kidneys. So norepinephrine acts through the alpha-1 receptor to vasoconstrict all major renal blood vessels. Um, endothelin um, release, um, stimulated by angiotensin 2, antidiuretic hormone, thrombin, um, reactive oxygen species, and shearing forces on the endothelium, causes vascular muscle, a smooth muscle cell vasoconstriction. In addition, it increases aldosterone secretion, stimulates um, atrial natriuretic peptide, and decreases renal blood flow and GFR, and increases sodium excretion. Um, it, uh, the endothelin is um, known to be the most potent vasoconstrictor, so endothelin. So vasopressin directly stimulates vasoconstriction via the V1 receptor on the blood vessel wall. At low doses, it preserves renal blood flow, whereas at high doses, it can lead to renal ischemia. So atrial natriuretic peptide is released by the atria in response to stretching of the atrial wall in states of volume expansion. It increases GFR and natriuresis by the afferent arteriolar vasodilation and afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction, as well as sodium reabsorption inhibition in the medullary collecting duct. So for vasodilation, um, two gases mainly act as hormones at the level of the kidney to stimulate vasodilation. So one would be nitric oxide. This is triggered by the vascular shear stress, which um, 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 initiates nitric oxide synthase production, which forms nitric oxide. This um, causes diffusion to the vascular smooth muscle cells, um, thereby um, uh, increasing the production of CGMP, causing smooth muscle relaxation, which increases vascular resistance and decreases GFR. Um, the other gas would be carbon monoxide, which is produced by the heme oxygenase. So heme um, oxygenase converts heme into carbon monoxide, iron, and biliverdine. The carbon monoxide um, causes vasodilation in the renal vasculature and counteracts catecholamine-induced vasoconstriction. So um, the kidneys are involved in RBC production. So basal RBC production is roughly 10 RBCs per hour. So the rate is greatly increased during times of anemia or hypoxia. The kidneys are responsible for 90% of erythropoietin production. The remaining 10% is found in the liver. So erythropoiesis is decreased in states of inflammation and renal insufficiency. So it is important to take note of that. So kidneys are also associated with bone mineralization. Uh, they play an important role in the regulation of vitamin D activity. So vitamin D3 has minimal biologic activity. In the liver, it is hydroxylated through the action of 25 hydroxylase to form calcidiol. So the calcidiol molecule is bound to vitamin D binding protein and is transported to the kidney where it is filtered and reabsorbed in the renal tubular cells. So in the tubular cell, vitamin D3 is also hydroxylated by 1-alpha-hydroxylase or 24-alpha-hydroxylase um, to produce either inactive 24-25-dihydroxycholecalciferol or the active of 1-25-dihydroxycholecalciferol or calcitriol. So calcitriol functions through, the, uh, through a single intracellular vitamin D receptor to regulate gene transcription. So um, its primary function it's, is the maintenance of serum calcium and phosphorus levels. So PTH um, can also be produced 
um, which uh, is part of homeostasis. It maintains normal serum calcium and phosphorus levels by increasing bone resorption and increasing renal reabsorption of calcium and excretion of phosphorus. So um, next uh, would be renovascular hypertension. So it is a clinical syndrome marked by a rise in arterial pressure um, with or without associated ischemic and hypertensive renal injury. So uh, the most common cause is renal artery stenosis, which is defined as narrowing of the renal artery by more than 50% of its natural luminal diameter. So renovascular disease has been estimated to be the cause of renal failure in 5 to 15% of those older than 50 years of age and may count for 10 to 20% of um, ES and stage renal disease patients. So um, there are usually four types of fibromuscular dysplasia, which principally is the cause of uh, renal artery stenosis. So it, it would be medial fibroplasia, perimedial fibroplasia, intimal fibroplasia, and medial hyperplasia. So medial hyper, fibroplasia is the most um, common type. So it occurs um, almost ex exclusively in women 25 to 50 years old. And there would be a string of beads appearance on angiography. The lesions would involve the distal half, usually the distal half, the main renal artery, and may extend into the branches. However, it is not likely to progress to complete occlusion, nor are they likely to experience a decrease in their overall renal function. So in this um, arteriogram, it demonstrates the web-like stenosis with interposed segments of dilation, which are the lar large beads, which is typical of medial fibroplasia. So large beads um, and yung medial fibroplasia, hindi siya nagko-completely occlude ng vasculature. Perimedial fibroplasia occurs almost exclusively in women 5 to 15 years of age. So it occurs classically in the mid-renal artery. So um, there are aneurysmal beads uh, parang sa medial fibroplasia um, in perimedial fibroplasia. Uh, but Unlike the one in medial fibroplasia, it never ex exceeds the diameter of the main renal artery. So maliliit lang yung beads. So pag large beads, medial fibroplasia. If left untreated, perimedial fibroplasia often progresses to renal occlusion and loss of renal function. So in this uh, renal arteriogram, it shows a tight stenosis in the mid portion, mid portion of the renal artery with a small string of beads appearance, which is typical of perimedial fibroplasia. Next would be intimal fibroplasia. It occurs predominantly in children and young adults. It may be complicated by disruptions of the internal elastic lamina and hence may it result in dissection, arterial wall hematoma, and renal infarction. So it usually, uh, usually in the proximal renal artery, um, it occurs um, in the proximal area. However, they may also occur in the mid or distal renal artery and without intervention they are likely to progress and result in loss of renal function. So uh, this renal arteriogram demonstrates a localized highly stenotic smooth lesion involving the distal renal artery um, from intimal fibroplasia with demonstration um, with the demonstration of uh, proximal left renal artery stenosis in the arrow. So lastly, the medial hyperplasia, 2 to 3% lung, is a rare disease and hence uh, poorly studied. Um, it is angiographically indistinguishable from intimal fibroplasia. Um, histologically, it shows uh, smooth muscle cell hyperplasia with uh, no associated fibrosis. Um, renal vascular hypertension should be suspected in the presence of the following signs and symptoms. So there are eight. So um, one would be severe or refractory hypertension with evidence of grade 3 or 4 hypertensive retinopathy. Um, there could also be abrupt onset of moderate to severe hypertension, particularly in a non-mortensive or previously well-controlled hypertensive. Um, can occur, um, it can be suspected if um, the onset of hypertension is before age 20 or after age 50, particularly in those without a family history of hypertension. Um, other one would be the presence of diffuse vascular disease and or evidence of cholesterol embolization. So it can also be suspected in um, 
patients with paradoxic worsening of hypertension with the use of diuretics. Um, I'll explain the recurrent episodes of heart failure, um, which is a typical of a flash pulmonary edema. Um, the presence of a systolic diastolic abdominal brewery that radiates to both flanks and unexplained worsening of renal function with or without hypertension or in association with the use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs or with a reduction of blood pressure to the current accepted norm with the use of other anti-hypertensive agents. So testing for renal, uh, renovascular hypertension should be pursued only if revascularization is being seriously considered since effective BP control may be achieved in most patients with renovascular hypertension. And it remains uncertain whether the correction of an underlying vascular lesion can result in long-term BP control or preservation of renal function. Um, so previously, um, to diagnose renovascular hypertension, they use IVPs, um, measurement of plasma renin activity, and renal scintigraphy. However, there are new non-invasive screening tests with high sensitivity and specificity. So magnetic uh, resonance angiography has a 100% sensitivity and um, 71 to 96% specificity. Uh, CT angiography has a 98% sensitivity and 94% specificity. However, it, uh, the specificity can drop up to 81% in patients with renal insufficiency. And duplex um, Doppler ultrasonography provides many advantages. It can demonstrate bilateral disease it does not require the discontinuation of antihypertensive therapy or the exposure to, um, to potentially nephrotoxic contrast and is accurate for those with renal failure. However, despite, despite these advantages, the use of um, doctors' ultrasonography is limited by the fact that it is time-consuming, operator-dependent, and is technically difficult um, to perform. So for the management, um, Medi for the medical therapy, uh, control of BP in those with renovascular hypertension may be achieved in more than 90% of patients with medical therapy alone. Um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs have been shown to be particularly efficacious because the hypertension is often the result of activation of the RAS, the renin-angiotensin system. When used as monotherapy, ACE inhibitors may control BP in 80% of patients and when combined with a diuretic, control may be increased to almost 90%. Medical therapy may reduce BP below a critical level and induce um, ongoing renal, renal ischemia. So distal to the uh, uh, renal ischemia distal to the arterial lesion, which can result in tubular atrophy, um, glomerulosclerosis, loss of function, and affected kidney. Hence, um, renal function should be closely monitored whenever antihypertensive agents are used in patients with suspected renovascular hypertension. Um, for the more invasive techniques, uh, the, you can do percutaneous transluminal renal artery angioplasty. It is a technique by which uh, stenotic renal arteries are dilated with a balloon tip catheter. Uh, lesions that are uh, most amenable to, to PTRA includes those that are less than 10 millimeters in length and are partially occluded. However, even when technically successful, um, the restenosis rate after PTRA is significant and may occur shortly after the procedure with recurrence of uncontrolled or accelerated hypertension. Um, with the advent of medical therapy and PTRA, the need for surgical revascularization and reconstruction of the renal artery has diminished. However, patients may still benefit from surgical intervention. Um, the patients who may benefit are the ones who exhibit malignant or accelerated or uncon uncontrollable hypertension, those who do not tolerate medical therapy, or those with rapid deterioration of renal function, with serum creatinine remaining between 1.5 and 3.0 milligrams per deciliter. So next would be um, acute kidney injury. So it is an acute rise in serum creatinine um, and or an acute decline in renal, renal output. Um, it, uh, it, it is an abrupt decline in renal kidney function and uh, the decline occurs over hours to days and results in the accumulation of byproducts of metabolism and the dysregulation of electrolyte homeostasis, acid-base, and volume status. 
So the gold standard for evaluating kidney function is the measurement of GFR using a marker of uh, pure glomerular filtration. So estimation of creatinine clearance using the most accurate method, which the CKD epi um, is being used uh, with the formula being discussed earlier. So one set of criteria used to define uh, acute kidney injury is known as the risk injury, failure, loss of kidney function, and ESRD, or the RIFLE criteria, which divides acute kidney injury and chronic kidney failure into stages based on severity and duration. Um, contrasting from the RIFLE criteria, the kidney disease improving global outcomes, or the KDGO, includes an acute rise in serum creatinine more than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter within 48 hours as a definition of acute kidney injury along with the rise in serum creatinine of at least 1.5 times baseline within seven days, or urine volume below 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour for six consecutive hours. So unlike RIFLE, the KDGO criteria do, um, do not include scoring related to prolonged kidney failure or ESRD. So a classic way to divide um, acute um, kidney injury is by pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal or obstructive causes. However, prolonged prerenal physiology may lead to intrinsic kidney ischemia and injury, such as is seen with prolonged hepatorenal syndrome. So the, cases, uh, the greatest proportion of hospital-acquired acute kidney injury is secondary to acute tubular necrosis, so intrinsic yun, and it accounts for 45%. So um, in prerenal kidney injury, it is caused by a new renal hypoperfusion that leads to a fall in GFR, typically with urinary sodium avidity or affinity. So the hallmark of pre-renal disease is its reversibility after treatment of the underlying cause with absence of structural damage to the kidney if treated promptly. So the kidney can maintain normal renal blood flow and GFR with systemic perfusion pressures as low as 55 to 60 and millimeters mercury under normal conditions. So although such autoregulation of kidney blood flow may be compromised in CKD, um, making patients with um, chronic disease more susceptible to acute kidney injury. So um, ACE and ARBs um, exert a vasodilatory effect on the efferent arteriole and thus reduce GF, um, glomerular pressure and filtrate fraction. Um, such agents are of great value in treatment of diabetic nephropathy and congestive heart failure and help to reduce proteinuria and convey renal protection in proteinuric kidney diseases. Um, however, it increases the risk of prerenal acute kidney injury during periods of hypotension and hypoperfusion. Hence, um, kapag, um, uh, when patients uh, usually have acute kidney injury, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are to be avoided or held. So although pre-renal acute kidney injury may often occur as a result of volume depletion, such as after hemorrhage or GI losses, it can also occur in instances of total body overload, such as in um, congestive heart failure and cirrhosis, which often occurs with total body overload, edema, and ascites, and yet are defined by pre-renal acute kidney injury, typically with a low urine sodium concentration. So treatment is directed towards treating the underlying disease state in an effort to optimize systemic hemodynamics and renal perfusion. So for post-renal kidney injury, um, so obstruction of the urinary tract can be a cause of acute kidney injury and can be acute or chronic, complete or partial, and involve any area of the lower urinary tract. So urinary uh, unilateral obstruction may initially go unnoticed in terms of kidney function and changes in creatinine. Although patients may gradually lose function in a single kidney, rendering them with reduced kidney mass and GFR. So bilateral obstruction can present dramatically, often with oligoanuria and advanced kidney failure. So common causes of bilateral obstruction would include congenital posterior urethral valves in a younger population, um, bladder dysfunction, including neurogenic bladder, and prostatic diseases in men. So oligoanuria is a diagnostic sign that suggests complete obstruction and is an uncommon feature of AKI overall. So post-obstructive diuresis 
um, user usually represents um, an appropriate response to prolonged obstruction with elimination of excess fluid and sodium. Um, the osmotic um, effect created, it can be due to the osmotic effect created by excretion of elevated blood, urea and nitrogen, or water loss resulting from tubular injury. This is a condition that typically lasts 24 to 72 hours and can result in dehydration and hypernatremia, as well as electrolyte wasting. So it is recommended to replace one half the urine output using hypotonic solution, such as 0.45% in ACL, and to monitor electrolytes closely during this interval. So most cases of this type of acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients is secondary to acute tubular necrosis in the majority of cases. Um, most common causes of acute tubular necrosis in the hospitalized setting would include hypoperfusion and ischemic injury. And uh, most are related to operative bleeding, intraoperative hypotension, sepsis, and shock. So contrast nephropathy is a type of acute tubular necrosis that is generally reversible, but can contribute to patient morbidity, mortality, and long-term kidney impairment. So iodinated contrast, particularly with higher osmolarity, has been shown to induce renal vasoconstriction and medullary ischemia. So yun yung mechanism of injury ng contrast nephropathy. And also cause direct toxic effects at the proximal renal tubules. So risk factors would include an old age, a pre-existing CKD, diabetic nephropathy, congestive heart failure, hemodynamic instability, higher or smaller contrast, uh, NSAID usage, higher volume of contrast, and volume depletion before contrast exposure. Hence, the use of isotonic IV fluids before and after contrast is a staple in the prevention of contrast nephropathy despite only limited data on protection. So nephrologic, uh, nephrotoxic pharmacologic agents are a common source of kidney injury through direct toxic effects or by causing inflammation. Um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are approved for the treatment of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Zolidronic acid is also being used for metastatic prostate CA. Hence, urologists involved with the treatment should be aware of the potential nephrotoxicity associated with such agents. So acute kidney injury associated with these agents may require cessation of drug therapy and or corticosteroid treatment. So chronic kidney disease as is defined as kidney impairment sustained beyond three months with a reduction in GFR, structural abnormalities in the kidneys, and or proteinuria. So the KDO guidelines um, included albuminuria in the definition of CKD to emphasize the prognostic implications related to abnormal urinary protein excretion. So the presence of CKD has implications in terms of greater risks for AKI. Uh, precautions should be taken in taken in CKD patients to avoid nephrotoxic drugs, avoid or limit iodinated contrast exposure and to dose medications appropriately with adjustment for level of kidney function. So diabetes mellitus and hypertension account for the largest percentage of cases um, followed by glomerular diseases. Such reporting, however, may be due to the fact that many patients go without kidney biopsy and lack a definitive cause of end-stage renal disease. Um, there continues to be a set steady growth of ESRD patients on renal replacement therapies throughout the world, although their survivability is improving um, through, um, through the years. So outcome comparison suggests that kidney transplantation is still the best overall treatment for ESRD patients, despite advances in dialysis care and modalities. So next, we go to the physiology and pharmacology of the renal pelvis and ureter. So the function of the ureter is to transport urine from the kidney to the bladder. So under normal conditions, ureteral peristalsis originates with electric activity at the pacemaker sites located in the proximal portion of the urinary collecting system. The electric activity is then propagated distally and gives rise to the mechanical event of peristalsis, um, ureteral contraction, which propels the bolus of urine distally. So efficient propulsion of the urinary bolus de depends on the ureter's ability to completely co-opt its balls. So urine passes into the bladder by way of the ureter vesic vesicle junction or the UVJ, which under normal conditions permits urine to pass from the ureter into the bladder, but not from the bladder into the ureter. This can be explained later. So um, 
for the cellular anatomy, the ureteral smooth muscle cells is around um, 250 to 400 um, nanometers in length, uh, micrometers in length. So endoplasmic or sarcoplasmic reticulum dispersed in the cytoplasm serves as calcium storage sites. Dispersed in the sarcoplasm are the contractile proteins, actin and myosin. So depending on the local calcium ion concentration, they interact to produce contraction or relaxation. Any process that leads to a significant increase in calcium concentration in the region of the contractile protein, proteins results in contraction. Conversely, any process that leads to a significant decrease in calcium concentration in the region of the contractile prote proteins results in relaxation. So around the periphery of the cells are numerous cavitary structures, um, some of which open to the outside of the cell and are referred to as calveolae. So these calveolae contain a cytoskeletal protein, uh, calveolin, and a variety of signal transduction molecules and receptors for growth factors and cytokines. A double layer of cell membrane surrounds the cell. The inner plasma membrane surrounds the entire cell, but the outer basement membrane is absent at areas of close cell-to-cell -cell contact, which, is, um, which are referred to as intermediate junctions. So the electric properties of all excitable tissues depend on distribution of ions on the inside and the outside of the cell membrane and on the relative permeability of the cell membrane to these ions. So when a ureteral muscle cell is in a non-excited or resting state, the electric potential difference across the cell membrane um, transmembrane potential is referred to as the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is determined primarily by the distribution of potassium ions across the cell membrane and by the permeability of the membrane to potassium. So in the resting state, the potassium concentration of the inside of the cell is greater than that of the outside. Um, an electric gradient is then created due to this difference in concentrations. The outward movement of the positively charged potassium ions would make the inside of the cell membrane negative with respect to the outside of the cell membrane. So the reverse is true for sodium, at least it is more concentrated extracellularly. An inward movement of sodium along its concentration gradient would make the inside of the cell membrane less negative with respect to the outside of the cell membrane. Um, so there is a pump mechanism um, for extruding sodium from within the cell against concentration and electrochemical gradients. Inward movement of potassium is coupled with outward movement of sodium. This mechanism helps to maintain a steady state of ion distribution across the cell membrane and, um, um, and then create a stable resting membrane potential. So to maintain a steady state ion distribution across the cell membrane with um, potassium outside um, less than the potassium inside and the sodium ions outside greater than the sodium ions inside and to prevent the transform membrane potential from becoming lower than the measured ureteral resting membrane potential. Um, an active it's 22 hours. Capable of extruding sodium from within the cell against a concentration and an electrochemical gradient is required. So this dynamic process enables the ureter in its resting state to maintain a relatively low resting membrane potential. So when a ureteral cell is stimulated, the polarization occurs and with the inside of the cell membrane becoming less negative than it was before stimulation. So if a sufficient, sufficient area of the cell membrane is depolarized rapidly enough to reach a critical level of transmembrane potential, which is referred to as a threshold potential, a uh, regenerative depolarization or an action potential is initiated. The action potential, which is the primary event in the conduction of the peristaltic impulse, has the capability to act as a stimulus for excitation of adjacent quiescent cells and through a chain of events gives, gives rise to the ureteral contraction. So when the ureteral cell is excited, its membrane loses its, prefer, uh, its preferential permeability to potassium and becomes more permeable to calcium ions that move inward across the cell membrane, primarily through the fast L-type calcium channels, and gives rise to the upstroke of the action potential. So after reaching the peak of its action potential, the ureter maintains its potential for a period of time, which is the plateau of the action potential, before the transmembrane potential returns to its resting level. Uh, referred to as repolarization. The plateau phase appears to depend on the persistence of an inward 
calcium current and on sodium influx through a voltage dependent sodium channel. Prolongation of the inward calcium current and duration of the action potential correlates with an increased force of contraction. So electric activity arises in a cell either spontaneously or in response to an external stimulus. If the activity arises spontaneously, the cell is referred to as a pacemaker cells, um, where the transmembrane resting potential is lower or less negative. The pacemaker cell does not remain constant, but rather undergoes a slow, spontaneous depolarization. Um, the ionic conduction underlying pacemaker, pacemaker activity in the upper urinary tract is due to the opening and slow closure of the voltage-activated L-type calcium channels, prostaglandins and excitatory tachykinins released from sensory nerves help maintain autorhythmicity in the upper urinary tract through maintenance of calcium mobilization. It has also been determined that autonomic neurotransmitters have little role in maintaining pyelourethral motility. So in humans, the pacemaker cells are located near the pelvic aliceal border. So pacemaker potentials have a lower resting membrane potential, a slower rate of rise, and a lower amplitude than action potentials recorded from non-pacemaker cells. These are typical smooth muscle cells that give rise to pacemaker activity. In contrast to typical smooth muscle cells have less than 40% of their cellular area occupied by contractile elements and demonstrate sparse immunary activity for smooth muscle and actin. So although the primary pacemaker um, for ureteral peristalsis is located in the proximal portion of the collecting system, other areas of the ureter may act as latent pacemakers. So latent pacemaker cells are present throughout the ureter. When the latent pacemaker site is freed from its domination by the primary pacemaker, it may then act as a pacemaker. So excitable cells possess resistive and capacitative membrane properties similar to those of a cable or core conductor. The transverse resistance of the membrane is higher than the long, longitudinal resistance of the extracellular or intracellular fluid. This allows current um, resulting from a stimulus to propagate along the length of the fibers. That's the spread of uh, such current is referred to as an electrotonic spread. Uh, stimulation of the ureter produces a contraction wave that propagates proximally and distally from the site of stimulation. Under normal conditions, electric activity arises proximally and is conducted distally from one muscle cell to another across area of close cellular opposition referred to as intermediate junctions. So gap junctions consisting of groups of channels in the plasma membrane of adjacent smooth muscle cells enable exchange of ions and small molecules, and they play a role in electric coupling between adjacent cells. Conduction velocity in the ureter is around 2 to 6 centimeters per second. So any process that results in a significant increase in calcium in the region of the contractile pro proteins favors the development of a contraction. Um, any process that results in a significant decrease in calcium in the region of the contractile proteins favors relaxation. So the contractile event depends on the concentration of free sarcoplasmic calcium in the region of the contractile proteins, which are actin and myosin. So in skeletal muscles, um, calcium appears to act as a derepressor through alteration of the troponin tropomyosin complex. Smooth muscles, on the other hand, uses calcium in the sarcoplasm to form a complex with the protein calmodulin, so may calcium calmodulin complex, which activates the myosin light chain kinase, or the MLCK, which phosphorylates the myosin light chain, allowing actin to activate myosin um, ATPase activity and leading to hydrolysis of ATP and causing smooth muscle shortening. So we have contractile proteins such as the RO or RO kinase. It inhibits myosin phosphatase, prevents the phosphorylation of the myosin light chain, which in turn increased, um, increases calcium sensitization of smooth muscles. So there is also the camp-dependent protein kinase, which decreases um, MLCK activity by decreasing affinity for calmodulin. Uh, 
So in the process of contraction, the inward movement of extracellular calcium into the cell through L-type voltage-dependent calcium channels during the upstroke of the action potential provides a significant source of sarcoplasmic calcium. Another source would be the sodium calcium exchange pump with outward movement of sodium and inward movement of calcium. Furthermore, calcium is also released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which may be released by IP3 and ryanodine receptors. So the functional response to a number of hormones, neurotransmitters, and other agents is mediated by second messengers. The agonist or first messenger interacts with specific membrane-bound receptor, um, uh, through, which is the agonist receptor complex, and then activates or inactivates an enzyme that leads to alteration of an amount of a second messenger within the cell. So in usual second messengers would be the CAMP, the CGMP, the IP3, and the diacylglycerol. So CAMP mediates the relaxing effects of beta-adrenergic beta agonists in a variety of smooth, muscle, smooth muscles. Um, agonists combined with the receptor on the outer side of the cell membrane. Um, the receptor agonist complex in turn via a stimulatory G protein, GS, activates the enzyme adenylcyclase on the inner surface of the cell membrane, which in the presence of magnesium GTP results in the conversion of ATP to CAMP. CAMP is then postulated to cause an increased uptake of calcium into the intracellular storage sites with the resultant decrease in calcium in the region of the contractile proteins, proteins that results in relaxation. CAMP may also have other actions that inhibit the contractile process. The enzyme phosphodiesterase degrades CAMP to 5-AMP and is inhibited by PD inhibitors such as theophylin. Insulin has also been shown to activate CAMP phosphodiesterase activity in the ureter. Uh, another cyclic nucleotide, CGMP, also causes smooth muscle relaxation. So CGMP is synthesized from GTP by the enzyme guanylylcyclase and degraded to 5-GMP by a phosphodiesterase as well. Nitric oxide synthase converts L-arginine to um, nitric oxide and L-citrulline in a reaction that requires nicotinamide adenosine nucleotide phosphate, or NADPH. So uh, nitric oxide released from the nerve activates the enzyme guanylocyclase in the smooth muscle cell with the resultant conversion of GTP to CGMP, and thus smooth muscle relaxation occurs. So nitric oxide synthase containing nerves have been demonstrated in the human ureter. So the agonist combines with the um, receptor on the outer side of the cell membrane. Um, the receptor agonist complex in turn activates the enzyme phospholipase C, which leads to the hydrolysis of um, PIP2 or polyphosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphonate with the formation of two second messengers. So one would be the IP3 and the other would be DAG. DAG. The, the, the activation of um, the phospholipase C involves a G protein, GQ. Um, IP3 mobilizes calcium from the intracellular stores, um, like the endoplasmic reticulum, and this leads to a functional response. Um, while diacylglycerol binds to an enzyme, protein kinase C, which results in phosphorylation of proteins in a subsequent functional response. So the acylglycerol also activates phospholipase A and is a source of arachidonic acid, which is a substrate for pro, uh, prostaglandin synthesis. Um, arachidonic acid then stimulates guanylocyclase activity to form CGMP. So there's um, also still a role of, for the nervous system in ureteral function. Although um, the ureter is a syncytial type of smooth muscle without discrete neuromuscular function and ureteral peristalsis occurs without innervation. Um, it has been suggested that the nervous system plays at least a modulating role in ureteral peristalsis. And nerves are present in the muscular layer and adventitia of the ureter, especially the distal ureter. So it activates mainly through sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. So for the parasympathetic nervous system, um, in terms of ureteral activity, there have been five um, musculinic subtypes documented, M1 to M5, 
So M1, 3, and M5 are both all excitatory. They all use GQ protein and they all produce IP3 and DAG. Yeah, excitatory sila because they release um, calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. While M2 and M4 are inhibitory. They use um, GI protein and they produce CAMP. And as I discussed earlier, CAMP induces smooth muscle relaxation. So muscarinic cholinergic receptors have been demonstrated in human ureters. And it has been suggested that M2 receptor activation may inhibit smooth muscle relaxation that results from activation of adenylocyclase. It has also been determined that there is a higher density of M2 and M3 muscarinic receptors in the human ureter. So the, the prototypic cholinergic agonist is acetylcholine, which um, serves as a, the neurotransmitter at neuromuscular junctions of somatic motor nerves uh, at the preganglionic parasympathetic and sympathetic neuroeffector junctions and the postganglionic parasympathetic neuroeffector sites. So uh, acetylcholine is stored in vesicles within synaptic terminals. So cholinergic agonists, including acetylcholine, carbacol, and botanicol, in general, have been observed to have an excitatory effect on the ureteral and renal pelvic function in that they increase the frequency and force of contractions. So the effects of anticholinesterases such as phytos, uh, physostigmine and neostigmines parallel the excitatory effects of acetylcholine and other parasympathomimetics on the ureter. Uh, atropine um, is a competitive agonist of the muscarinic effects of acetylcholine. Um, although atropine has been shown to inhibit the excitatory effects of parasympathomimetic agents and, and physostigmine on a variety of ureteral and calicial preparations, the majority of studies have shown that atropine has little direct effect on ureteral activity in humans. So agents, um, for the sympathetic nervous system, agents that primarily activate alpha adrenergic receptors, such as norepinephrine and phenylephrine, tend to stimulate ureteral and renal pelvic activity. While agents that primarily activate beta adrenergic receptors, such as isoproterenol, tend to inhibit ureteral and renal pelvic activity. So the ureter contains excitatory alpha-adrenergic and inhibitory beta-adrenergic receptors, um, nor epinephrine being primarily an alpha-adrenergic agonist, increases the force of electrically induced ureteral contractions, while isoproterenol, which is a beta-adrenergic agonist, depresses contractility. So alpha-1A adrenoceptors appear to be more involved in the maintenance of baseline ureteral tonus than in the potentiation of ureteral peristaltic activity. So um, the greatest concentration of alpha receptors are found in the distal ureter. Um, Pinakamarami will be alpha 1D followed by alpha 1A and then alpha 1D. So all three beta adrenergic receptors are expressed in the human ureter. Those be, um, beta 3, yung pinakamadami. Uh, expression of beta adrenergic receptors are decreased in a dilated ureter. Beta agonist compounds are noted to be more potent dilators of ureteral segments than alpha antagonists. So in the ureter, there is evidence to suggest that ATP is involved in obstructive processes. ATP may be involved in signaling visceral pain with ureteral dilatation, um, which is a renal colic. It has been proposed that ureteral distension causes release of ATP from the urothelium, which in turn activates purinor receptors on suburothelial nociceptive sensory nerves. So um, for the force length relations in the ureter and pelvis, express, um, uh, exp it expresses uh, the relation between the force developed by the muscles um, when it is stimulated under isometric condition and the resting length of the muscle at the time of stimulation. So because the ureter is a viscoelastic structure, the resting or contractile force developed at any given length depends on the direction in which the change in length is occurring and on the, length, uh, on the rate of length change. This is referred to as hysteresis. So para sa yung lag due to its viscoelastic structure. So um, 
when the ureter is stretched, the resting force increases. If the length is kept constant at its new longer length after a stretch, changes occur that result in a decrease in the resting force or stress relaxation. So force velocity relations depict the relation between the load and the velocity of shortening. So the maximal velocity of shortening, Vmax, represents the velocity of shortening at zero load. So force velocity curves depict the relation between the load and the velocity of shortening. So Vmax values in the ureter are in the range of 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 lengths per second. So the force velocity curve intersects the abscissa at uh, zero shortening. Uh, which is the isometric condition at which the load is great. Shortening depends on the total load lifted with the ureter shortening to a lesser extent with heavier loads. So at normal urine flows, the frequency of caliceal and renal pelvic contractions is greater than that in the upper ureter. Sorry. Um, and there is a relative block of electric activity at the ureter of pelvic junction. So at these um, flows, the renal pelvis fills. Um, as renal pelvic pressure rises, urine ex is extruded into the upper ureter, which is initially in a collapsed state. Uh, ureteral, uh, ureteral contractile pressures that move in the, uh, the bolus of urine um, are higher than renal pelvic pressures. And a closed UPJ may be protective of the kidney in dissipating back pressure from the ureter. So as the flow rate increases, the block at the ureteropelvic junction ceases, and a one-is-to-one -one correspondence between pacemaker and ureteral contractions develops. So um, disruption of cell-to-cell -cell propagation of peristaltic activity results in impairment of urine transport across the ureteropelvic junctions, as it's what happens with um, stone obstruction. So at normal flow rates, as the renal pelvis fills, a rise in renal pelvic pressure occurs, and urine is extruded into the upper ureter, which initially is in a collapsed state. The contraction wave originates in the most proximal portion of the ureter and moves the urine in front of it in a distal direction. The urine uh, that had previously entered the ureter is formed into a bolus. To propel the bolus of the urine effic uh, efficiently, uh, the contraction wave must completely co up the ureteral walls. The bolus that is pushed in front of the contraction wave lies almost entirely in a passive, non-contracting part of the ureter. So baseline or resting ureteral pressure is approximately 0 to 5 centimeters water and superimposed ureteral contractions ranging from 20 to 80 centimeters water occur 2 to 6 times per minute. So under normal flows in which bolus formation occurs, the amount of urine transported per unit time is significantly less than the maximal transport capacity of the ureter. At extremely high flows, uh, as are employed in perfusion studies, the ureteral walls do not co up and a continuous column of fluid rather than a series of boluses is transported. So when transport becomes inadequate, stasis of urine occurs with resultant ureteral dilatation. So inadequate transport can result either from too much fluid entering the ureter per unit time or from too little fluid exiting the ureter per unit time. So with increasing um, urine flow rates, the initial response of the ureter is to increase peristaltic frequency. So after the maximal frequency is reached, uh, further increases in urine transport occur by means of increase in bolus volume. So frequency muna before increase ng volume. So at relatively low flow rates, small increases in flow result in large increases in peristaltic frequency. At higher flow rates, relatively large increases in flow result in only small increases in peristaltic frequency. As the flow rate continues to increase, however, several of the boluses coalesce. And finally, the ureter becomes filled with a column of fluid and dilates. At these high flow rates, urine transport is through an open tube. So um, the pressure within the bladder um, during the storage phase is paramount in determining the efficacy of urine transport across the UVJ. This is the pressure that the ureter must work against um, for the longest period of time. 
during filling of the normal bladder, sympathetic impulses and the viscoelastic properties of the bladder wall inhibit the magnitude of the intravesical pressure rise. However, in the non-compliant fibrotic bladder and in some forms of neurogenic vesicle dysfunction, relatively small increases in bladder volume result in large increases in the intravesical pressure with resultant impairment of ureter lactin. So the ureter has been shown to decompensate when sustained intravesical pressure approaches 40, 40 centimeters water. So under normal conditions and at normal flow rates, the contraction wave, which occludes the ureteral lumen, propagates distally with the urinal, urine bolus in front of it. When the bolus reaches the UVJ, the pressure within the bolus must exceed intravesical pressure for the bolus of urine to pass across the UVJ into the bladder. So under these conditions in which the contraction wave is able to, to go up the ureteral wall and move the urinary bolus distally, the pressure generated by the contraction wave exceeds the pressure within the urinary bolus. Um, as the bolus is ejected into the bladder, the distal ureter retracts within its sheath. The contracted ureteral ring just proximal to the ureteral orifice at the UVJ is relevant in the anti-reflux mechanism. So as the bolus is ejected into the bladder, the distal um, ureter retracts within its sheath. Uh, the distal scoping of the ureter within its sheath aids in decreasing UVJ resistance to flow and thus facilitates urine passage into the bladder. The UVJ is not, does not um, relax. So impediment of efficient bolus transfer across the UVJ into the bladder can occur when there is an obstruction at the UVJ, when intravesical pressure is excessive, or when flow rates are so high as to exceed the transport capacity of the normal UVJ. Under such conditions in which, um, in which the bolus of urine cannot pass freely into the bladder, the pressure within the bolus increases and may exceed the pressure in the contraction wave proximal to it. This results in an inability of the contraction wave to completely occlude the ureter. There is retrograde flow of urine from the bolus and only a fraction of the urinary bolus passes across the UVJ into the bladder. If the UVJ is obstructed um, or if the detrusor pressure is excessive, um, large boluses occurring at high flow conditions would not be completely discharged into the bladder because the contraction wave pushing the bolus would be forced open and intraureteral reflux would occur. So um, the effect of obstruction on ureteral function depends on the degree and duration of the obstruction, on the rate of urine flow, and on the presence or absence of infection. So backup of, back of urine occurs within the urinary collecting system, along with an associated increase in the baseline ureteral intraluminal pressure and an increase in ureteral length and diameter. Um, uh, this results uh, from the increased ureteral intraluminal pressure and the increased volume of urine retained within the ureter. This increase in intraluminal pressure depends on the kidney's continued production of urine that cannot, cannot pass beyond the site of obstruction. There is also a decrease in the velocity of electrical impulses that correlates with decreased peristaltic activity. The peristaltic contraction waves become smaller and are unable to co up the ureteral wall. Um, transport then becomes dependent on hydrostatic forces generated by the kidney. So superimposed infection may result in a complete absence of contraction, contractions in the obstructed ureter and contributes to impairment of urine transport. Um, within a few hours after the onset of obstruction, the intraluminal baseline ureteral pressure reaches a peak and then declines to a level only slightly higher than the normal baseline pressure. Um, this, uh, the decrease in ureteral pressure can be attributed to a decrease in renal blood flow, which in turn decreases the GFR and intratubular hydrostatic pressure, or it can be due to fluid reabsorption into the venous and lymphatics. So the persistence of dimensional changes in the face of a decrease in intraluminal pressure depends on the hysteretic properties of the viscoelastic elastic ureteral structure. So despite the muscle hypertrophy and the increase in contractility, it is uh, evident that the obstructed dilated ureter is less able than the normal ureter to generate the contractile pressures required for urine transport. 
although contractility increases after two weeks of obstruction, the decrease in wall, the wall's thickness to radius ratio, as uh, dictated by Laplace law, um, resulting from a marked increase in the interluminal diameter and thinning of the muscle layer accounts for the decrease in pressure. Uh, so the obstructed ureter is incapable of co-opting its lumen and efficiently propelling the urine bolus. If uh, the urine were removed from the lumen of the ureter, um, which is done by relieving the obstruction, the ureter obstructed for two weeks would be able to immediately co-opt its lumen and produce pressures comparable with those of uh, normal ureters. Two weeks of obst obstruction results in an increase in the ureteral contractility but a decrease in contractile intraluminal pressure. So this decreases the ability to generate an active intraluminal pressure and to co-op the ureteral lumen. Um, it impairs the urine uh, transport in the obstructed ureter. So next would be a vesico-ureteral reflux, the effect of VUR on ureteral function. So there are factors implicated in the development of VUR. Uh, one would be anatomic and functional abnormalities in the UVJ. Um, another would be inordinately high intravesical pressures and impaired ureteral function. So um, the relation between the length and the diameter of the intravesical segment of the ureter appears to be a factor in the prevention of BUR. So it is uh, noted to be approximately 1.5 cm in length and takes an oblique course through the bladder wall. Um, uh, it is composed of an intramural segment surrounded by the trusor muscle and a submucosal segment that lies directly under the bladder urethelium. Um, the normal ratio of intravesical tunnel length to ureteral diameter was 5 is to 1. And uh, the ratio was noted to be 1.4 is to 1 in children with vesico-ureteral reflux. So although an abnormality of the UVJ is the primary etiologic factor in most cases of reflux, evidence suggests that decreased ureteral peristaltic activity can still be a contributory factor. Even the mildest forms of VUR are associated with a decreased frequency of ureteral peristalsis. So the success rate of anti-reflux procedures is lower with poorly functioning dilated ureters. And although this may be related to technical factors, decreased peristaltic activity may be another reason for the failure. So infection within the urinary, um, upper urinary tract may impair urine transport. A number of studies have confirmed that bacteria and E. coli endotoxin can inhibit ureteral activity. Uh, it may be due to activation of potassium channels with the resultant inhibition of calcium entry through voltage-dependent L-type calcium channels. Um, it could also be an increased expression of um, nitric oxide synthase in response to bacterial induction. So activation of um, nitric oxide synthase leads to the formation of nitric oxide, which is a known smooth muscle relaxant. And this may contribute to inhibitory effects of infection on ureteral contractility. So um, there are factors that affect the spontaneous passage of calculi. Um, one would be the size and shape of the stone. Another would be intrinsic areas of narrowing within the ureter. Uh, another would be ureteral peristalsis. Um, another would be hydrostatic pressure of the column of urine proximal to the calculus. And another would be edema, inflammation, and spasm of the ureter at the site at which the stone is lodged. The peristaltic rate and baseline peak and um, the delta pressures increase the proxim, uh, increase sa, uh, proximal to the site of obstruction. Failure of transmission of effective peristalsis across the site of obstruction may hinder stone passage. So um, two factors um, were found uh, that appeared to be most useful in facilitating uh, stone passage. It would be um, an increase in hydrostatic pressure proximal to the calculus, and the other would be a relaxation of the ureter in the region of the stone. Uh, Theophylline, uh, PD5 inhibitors, calcium channel blockers have been documented to facilitate stone passage. Um, and alpha blockers were shown to produce an increased spontaneous stone expulsion rate after ESWL, um, decrease in renal colic, and improved tolerance of ureteral death. So these pharmacologic data can be interpreted to imply that ureteral relaxation in the region of a concretion could aid in stone passage. 
Um, indwelling ureteral stents are frequently used to bypass an obstructing ureteral calculus and or to dilate the ureter to facilitate subsequent ureteral rhinoscopy. A variety of alpha adrenergic, adrenergic agonists have been used to ameliorate stent-induced discomfort. Um, in addition to ureteral dilation, stents decrease ureteral activity and increase tissue inflammation. So age can also have an impact on ureteral function. So more marked degrees of ureteral dilation are observed in the neonate and young child than in the adult. So aging causes a decrease in the relaxant response of the ureter to beta adrenergic agonists. Contractility of the ureter was noted to increase in force starting at three weeks and three months of age. So pregnancy also has an effect on ureteral function. Hydrouretero-nephrosis of pregnancy begins in the second trimester of gestation and subsides within the first month after parturition. So this is more severe on the right side, although I don't know And the ureteral dilation does not occur below the pelvic brim. Obstruction appears to be the primary factor in the development of hydrouretero-nephrosis of pregnancy. Other investigators, um, however, have suggested a hormonal mechanism for the ureteral dilation of pregnancy. Um, progesterone has been noted to increase the degree of ureteral dilation during pregnancy and to retard the rate of disappearance of hydroureter in postpartum women. So uh, lastly, the drugs have an effect on the ureter. So histamine um, have both excitatory and inhibitory effects on the ureter through the H1 excitatory and H2 inhibitory. Serotonin is also excitatory, although they act indirectly through the release of norepinephrine from sympathetic nerves. Kinins increase the frequency of contraction and baseline ureteral intraluminal pressure. Um, angiotensin uh, was also noted to be excitatory in nature. Um, narcotic analgesics um, increase ureteral tone and the amplitude of contractions. Prostaglandins, um, PGE1, 2, and PGI2 are inhibitory while PGF2-alpha increases ureteral contractility. Um, in cardiac glycosides, uh, calcium antagonists inhibit ureteral activity, while potassium channel openers also inhibit renal pelvic and ureteral activity. Thank you, Daryl, for that lengthy talk topic and they're comprehensive. Uh, do we have questions from our consultants and residents for additional info? I think that will cover the... Everything. Everything in that chapter. So if we don't have any questions, uh, may we take our attendance. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, sir. Record naman, no? Liningal, liningal. Liningal si Daryl. Toxic, ka. Liningal yung mga nakikinig. Ikaw na, Daryl, mag-picture. Sorry, sir. Mag-a-manual na lang ako. Hindi na maroon ang dito. Hindi na maroon ang dito. <laughs> okay. okay. Pahinga na, pahinga na. Kirain na, tuloy na. Kirain na yan. Kirain na yan. Diba? Diba, sa amin sila yan. Dr. Matias, isa ka po. Hi. Isa ba? Tulog na sila yan. Okay, one, two. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>